I call this meeting of the Brockton School Committee to order and ask you to please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Please be seated. So we open up uh, each meeting with uh, hearing of visitors. It's an opportunity for any member of the community to come in front of the school committee, the superintendent and the mayor to be heard. Uh, the ground rules for hearing of visitors is that time is limited to, you must limit your remarks to three minutes and uh, all matters are taken under advisement. There is no uh, immediate response from the school committee. So at this uh, point, I'd like to invite up to speak uh, Julie Fairfield. Good evening. How are you? Good. How are you? Julie? Make yourself comfortable. Whenever you're ready, go ahead. I'm a teacher here at Procton High School. I'm oh, sorry. Um, I heard something tonight about tightening our belts. I don't know that we can tighten our belts anymore. I buy the pencils for my office. I buy the lined paper. I don't want a pat on the back for this. I don't. That's not why I tell you this. But how much more can we tighten our belts when I'm doing this? I love Amazon. But it just really upset me when I heard you say that. Because I voted for you. <laughs> and, um, and I think that that's, we just, we have to find a way to do this because we can't keep, I print all my papers for my students at my house. I bought an office printer so I could do that. Again, I don't want you to pat me on the back. I don't want you to say thank you, but should I really have to do that? I do that because my kids need it. Okay, so I want to ask and have you consider a freshman center. Um, in Texas, we had a lot of schools, that, uh, districts that had freshman centers that instead of sending kids to high school, immediately they would, go, they would all go to a freshman center. And um, I think that would alleviate a lot of the burden here at the high school um, and the teacher issue in the class size. But also I feel like a lot, these freshmen are not mature enough to be dealing with kids that are 19, 20, 21 years old. Because that's, and that's what they're interacting with. And when you have 13 and 14 year olds interacting with kids who are 18, 19, 20, 21 years old, I mean, I've, I've seen some kids that just can get turned around. So a freshman center, I feel like that would prepare them. And again, then you would have, you know, more room at the high school, you would have l lower class sizes. And I don't, I just thought, I don't know the cost. I don't know the feasibility. I just thought it would be something to think about. Thank you. Okay, next up on our agenda is the consent agenda. This is a, a block of routine business that the school committee will consider as one item in order to expedite the meeting. However, uh, prior to considering the, the consent agenda, any individual member of the school committee may request that an item be separated out of the consent agenda for separate discussion or consideration. So at this point, I'll ask if any members of the school committee would like any of the agenda items in the consent agenda removed. Hearing none, I'll entertain a motion on the consent agenda. Motion made, second, properly seconded. All in favor? Consent agenda is approved. So we're moving on to the report of the superintendent's schools. We do have two or three special uh, guests. Are we ready for cradles to crayons? I'm not sure. Is Carrie Wolf here? Um, I, I am going to speak about cradles to crayons, and uh, I'm not sure we were hoping Carrie would be able to be here. She's the manager of partner relations for cradles to crayons. Um, and over the past two years, this organization has given the Brockton Public Schools more than 4,000 backpacks for our elementary and our middle school. And just hearing the teacher from the high school just now, you can understand how important these supplies are to our children. And maybe that's something we even expand on.
when we talk about community organizations, it's always about the younger kids and starting school, and we know, all know the excitement of a new backpack. But also, maybe that's something that we can continue to ask some of these partners who have been terrific to us. So we will certainly listen to that. Um, each is filled with high quality supplies, books, and a personal note of encouragement to each child that opens the backpack. Um, the Cradles to Crayon was founded like many organizations when a person saw a simple need and filled it, turning compassion into action. It was born in Boston in 2004 and has expanded to Philadelphia and Chicago, and there are two more sites presently in the planning stages. They do provide for children from birth through age 12, which is why we might suggest something uh, other uh, with some of the students in our district, with everyday essentials. They need to thrive at home, at school, and at play. Their overreaching vision is a future free of childhood poverty. Um, it, they work with nearly 75,000 families in the uh, Boston area, individuals, community groups, and corporate volunteers in giving factories and at community-based events to serve more than 245,000 uh, children per year. So that certainly is worth our recognition. And I will tell you, many years ago, having been a school adjustment counselor in the district, I can remember driving at that time their facility was in Quincy. And I could go and get toys at Christmas time, I could get coats, I could get whatever a family needed to support them. So these organizations are truly sometimes a lifeline you know, for our families. So Joyce, I know you have been instrumental uh, in picking up the backpacks and helping to distribute them. Uh, and I want to thank you. And we do have a certificate for Kerry. And as I said, if we can connect with her, I certainly will invite her back. But I want to make sure that the thank you goes out there to Cradles to Crayons. Okay? Okay, very good. Uh, uh, <coughs> Next piece of business is uh, another guest, Michael Henry, is invited to come up and join us. Mr. Henry is uh, from our uh, PTA at the George School and called me with some exciting information last Friday. Good evening, everyone. It is a great pledge, pledge, uh, privilege for me to serve as president of the Manthala George Elementary School PTA in Brockton for the last two years. As you know, the George School hosts over 900 students and is the home of the Spanish two-way program. PTA's mission is to make every child's potential a reality of engaging and empowering our families and communities to advocate for our children. Each year, the PTA looks at ways to partner with our teachers, administration, families, and the Mass PTA. This year was the first time the George School participated in the Massachusetts PTA and National PTA Reflection Program. This program is a way to encourage students to explore the arts and expression, them, express themselves by giving positive recognition for their artistic efforts. Each year, thousands of students in preschool through grades 12 create and submit original works in the areas of dance, choreography, film production, literature, music composition, photography, visual arts. As I mentioned, the George School participated in this, in this first year. With our submissions, we have had one of our students win the visual arts category for, the art, for their age bracket at the state level and will now compete at the national level at the national PTA. Winners will be recognized in June in, in, the, in New Orleans. So this Thursday, April 5th, we will display a few of our participants of their artwork in the George School PTA meeting. Each year, the Massachusetts PTA holds their annual convention with speakers and workshops to discuss various issues that pertain to our children and our education in the local, state, and national level. This year's convention will be this Saturday, April 7th. This convention then recognizes various individuals and PTA organizations who have made, a type of, made some type of impact in their local PTA, their students and community at large. The following, the following were nominated and won their category. Outstanding Teacher of the Year. This award is recognized a student, I'm sorry, this award is recognized for a school teacher who is supportive and helpful for the personnel involvement of the PTA. And this year, we nominated Mr. Lewis Gelfie, grade three, who has won that award. Outstanding principal of the year. 
This award is recognized for a school principal for his or her supportive and helpful personnel involvement with the PTA. And we also nominated Mrs. Pohl, and she also won that award. And we also nominated um, Outstanding Superintendent of the Year, who recognizes uh, the, the school district superintendent who is supportive and helpful for their personnel support of the PTA. And this person was also one that we nominated, Ms. Kathleen Smith. And just a little note, uh, unfortunately, there was no category for this person, uh, the assistant superintendent, Mr. Thomas. Um, <laughs> but I want to say, you know, <laughs> in spirit, you're also in this category as well, because with all your support that you've given to the George School. Um, and then lastly, you know, um, there was one, another award, Spotlight of Men Award. And this is an award that focuses on ways to enga engage our fathers, stepfathers, grandfathers, uncles, and mentors uh, in the community. And uh, the George School PTA and myself has won that award as well. Um, so this award, these awards are honoring our teachers, administrators, and parents who recent accomplishment have made a better place for our extraordinary contributions to our, our children. So thank you very much. Congratulations to you all. Thank you, Mr. Henry. That's wonderful. So, Mrs. Cole, could you come down for a moment? So Mrs. Pohl is in her, uh, I believe, third year uh, at the George School, is that, am I correct? Yes. And in taking over the school, you know, I have, again, uh, had the privilege of working very closely beside her. I've been invited. I thank you always for inviting me to your many events. And the one thing that I will tell you, which is heartwarming, is sometimes when you have language barriers, and we talk about the Spanish two-way, we have a large uh, Ecuadorian population, and when I go to those PTA meetings, it is very inclusive. And they find ways where language is not a barrier. There are wonderful events. I know with your PTA, you have had all kinds of family events and continue to encourage everybody to take part, which makes us such a strong school district. So on behalf of the Brockton Public Schools, I want to thank you for your leadership. I want to thank Mr. Henry, who goes above and beyond uh, every, certainly every uh, activity and event you know, for the Jude George School. And I know Mr. Gelfi is one of those teachers, and I'm not so sure it's rare, because in the Brockton Public Schools, the teachers, they take part, they make sure that they're helping with those events, and it's just such a wonderful partnership. So thank you for highlighting the work in the Brockton Public Schools. We will be very proud, I believe, Saturday evening uh, to join you at the event uh, where we will be recognized and, um, and again, thank you for even taking the time to nominate. It means a lot to every one of us sitting here. So congratulations. Thank you. And I'll uh, just say um, thank you to Mr. Henry and our PTA. PTA. We have a wonderful, active PTA. Uh, even before I got there, I could tell um, they really went out of their way. Um, they had uh, their own, they were getting their own Spanish translations done, and they would have, um, you know, someone that would translate for us. And um, the bilingual department has helped us out since that parent has has left us since. Um, but there's always a very um, uh, deliberate effort to make sure that everyone is included and everyone has a voice. So I, I thank him for that, and we just have a wonderful group of parents. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you, thank you very much. So I think I'm very pleased that Cradles to Crayons just came in. Carrie? I'm so sorry I got that. I'm on the wrong side of the building. Oh, wow. Yeah, three years and I still don't know. Chris, may I? Carrie, please come up here. So, so Carrie, we just spoke about the work of Cradles to Crayons, and I did mention having been a school adjustment counselor in the district, and I'm talking many years ago. I was privileged to come to the uh, facility in Quincy. They were always very supportive of our students. And the work that you have done, I mentioned to our school committee woman, uh, Joyce Azak, you know, uh, thousands of backpacks, you know, children with all of the goodies and the notes of encouragement, and the continued growing of your program to continue to make sure that every child has an experience that is worthwhile for school. And we thank you uh, for all of your efforts. And we do have something. Uh, Maya Carpenter and I would like to award this to you. We're going to bring you out front. Okay. So, Mayor, would you like to 
I've done enough talking sure. on this. Uh, this uh, Why don't you come between us? We're going to put you right on camera, Kerry. Sounds good. I'm going to put my glasses yeah, on and make sure I get it right for you, Kerry. Okay. <laughs> so this is a certificate of recognition uh, from the Brockton School Committee to Kerry Wolf, with our deepest gratitude for the important work of Cradles to Crayons and its ongoing efforts to meet the needs of not only Brockton Public School students, but all children and families who may need a helping hand. And this is presented to you on behalf of the school committee and co-signed by Superintendent Smith and myself. It's my pleasure to present it to you. Thank you. Okay, and there you go. Kerry, thank, thank you for making you. the effort to be here. We really appreciate the support. Okay. And okay. Kerry, I have, I have to tell you this evening, we had a high school teacher that talked about not knowing you were here, the needs of some of our older children, supplies in classrooms, et cetera. So that's going to be a, a new mission to ask Cradles to Crayons to, to help us with some of the older students. Thank you guys. Thank you. You guys are a wonderful school district to work with. Everyone's been so supportive so, and really, um, really helpful in everything from transportation to getting the items out. So thank you. Well, thank you again. Thank you. Great yeah. time. Thank you. Appreciate it. Congratulations. I just wanted to say thank you so much. Uh, the, that was our second year um, partnering with Cradles to Crayon, Crayons, and um, I had the pleasure of picking up the backpacks last year, and Carrie is amazing. She's running around moving the pallets. Um, I, you have the energy. I, honestly, in the facility, it's an, an amazing facility, because I took a little tour while we were waiting for the backpacks, and um, hopefully this year they'll remember Brockton, Brockton students. Um, and I'm looking forward to working with you for many years. Thank you for all that you do. Same here. We're already in mode. Thank you. Thank you guys again. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, Tommy, would you like to introduce the guest for the next? So, we, our next uh, special guest joining us for a presentation this evening from ECA Solar, and I'd like to give uh, Mr. Minicello the opportunity to introduce them. Sure. Good evening. Um, about a month ago, I was approached by a couple of gentlemen, Todd Fryette and Vincent Michella from uh, ECA Solar Background. And um, we, um, Michael Thomas, uh, Deputy Thomas, and I met with um, the gentlemen, and they um, had a, um, an idea and a proposal for the city and the school committee to consider. Um, after meeting with them and um, being very impressed with uh, uh, their ideas and um, their vision for um, the city of Brockton and in particular the Brockton High School campus. Uh, we wanted to invite them to present some information to the whole, to the committee as a whole um, for consideration and um, this is going to be a very interesting proposal and a very uh, uh, perhaps beneficial uh, on an environmental level and also on a financial uh, level for the city and uh, the schools in particular. So um, with no for further ado, I'd like to introduce Todd Fryette and Vincent Michella. Gentlemen, thank you for coming and um, the floor is yours. Thank you for the warm introduction, Mr. Chairman. Uh, hello, my name is Todd Fryette. I am the founder of ECA Solar. Um, our company is now over four years old. We've had the pleasure of working in Brockton on a number of occasions, including um, building multi-million dollar assets at 1010 West Chestnut in Brockton, 560 Oak in Brockton. And we've also done some school presentations at the George Elementary Middle School as well. Um, I saw some of the earlier speakers today. We're absolutely thrilled to be here today. And um, our company, just as a brief background, we, we've now done over $50 million of solar arrays in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And we've recently got a commitment for $70 million more um, to put to work. And what we're about to present to you tonight is hopefully a, a big step in that regards. Um, we've, um, our general business model is to not ask customers for money, rather to do the opposite and say, what can we do to provide our resources and our balance sheet to work on behalf of municipalities, school districts, private entities? Um, without further ado, I'm going to turn the, the mic over to Vincent Michello. Vincent is our Vice President of Development and has been very active in our planning for, for tonight's meeting. Hello. Uh, so we've, we've been, we've had a keen eye on the Brockton High School for quite some time and 
Uh, we've, we've really put a lot of thought and effort into how we can work with the city and the school committee to you know, really provide as much value as possible. And um, you know, what, what the first thing that really stood out to us at the high school was the parking lot. Um, and in working with T.L. Edwards, who uh, I believe put the original lot on back in 1970, um, we feel that we can put a brand new lot on and pay for 100% of that. Um, they the price back in <laughs> <laughs> uh, No, unfortunately not. It's, uh, you know, in excess. So it's right around a million and a half dollars um, to do that. And that, that's something that we would, you know, certainly be uh, thrilled to do. Yeah, we, just to be clear, we got three different bids to to pay for the, the pavement, the new paving of the school lots. And the highest was in the 1.5 area, and um, TL Edwards was in the lower range of that, in the 1.2, 1.3 range. And we're happy to distribute those with the committee. Uh, and uh, you know, our second focus was, you know, really on the overall health and safety of the school and sort of environmental impact that we could bring along. And we feel that through introducing covered parking in a very similar fashion to Stonehill College and you know, a bunch of other schools across the Commonwealth, such as Lincoln Sudbury High School. Uh, I believe Wayland has one, um, and uh, you know, a few other schools. Uh, we feel that you know the students and faculty that park here throughout the day would be in a position where their you know their cars would be out of the elements, whether they're you know at school during a snowstorm or you know they're they're staying late for sports or whatever, and. Um, They'll be able to come out to a you know car that's been protected and is under some nice uh, clean LED lighting that's that's energy efficient and uh, very illuminative. So you know this is just a brief overview of some of the jobs that we've done in Brockton and a brief history that I believe Todd touched on. Yeah. Uh, so this is this shows our overall design that we've proposed. As you can see it is quite inclusive and covers just about every row of parking that, that we could find here uh, after walking and driving through the site with TL Edwards and a couple of other paving companies. Uh, and this gets into sort of the scope of work that we propose for redoing this parking lot. Now this is not um, just going over it with a top coat or any sort of maintenance. This would be a you know complete demolition and, and repavement from the beginning, just as it was done 30 years ago. The useful life of the lot that we propose is, is in excess of 30 years. So it really would be providing a you know, 30 plus year um, you know, solution to the problem here. Yeah, I, I would add that the main exclusion that's not included in this base bid from the paving companies that we would seek to pay for would be um, the sidewalks and curbs. Um, so I just wanted to note that for the record that was not included in their base bid. We can leave this slide for anyone. We don't want to get too into the weeds here and you know, we'd like to keep this fairly brief. Um, so we have two options as far as revenue goes for the school committee and Brockton Public Schools. One of them is if the school system does not want any of the energy produced from the site. In that case, we would sell all of it back to National Grid and what we could offer the school is a $500,000 prepaid lease that would be paid um, on the first day of system, system operation in entirety, and that would cover the 20-year the lease. Um, so it would be the $500,000 prepaid plus the $1.2 million plus for the parking lot would be ECA's contribution. Um, if Brockton Public School wanted to buy the energy, I know we've, we've heard concerns that the city of Brockton is, has reached its capacity for purchasing net metering. Um, while that is true, and, and we don't dispute that, uh, Governor Baker has introduced a new solar program that allows Brockton to start with a fresh slate. Uh, so what we'd be offering are not net metering credits, and you know any contracts that you've entered into in the past would in no way impact this. So we feel that if that's the route that the school wanted to go, we'd be able to save uh, over $100,000 a year for 20 years in energy costs for the school. 
And um, yeah, the, the last bullet point is typically if a, if a, a solar array, if there's on-site energy that's being used, or in this case of BPS, we're using the energy uh, under under state state law. It's typically tax exempt. Whereas if it was a standalone uh, solar array, in this case a parking canopy that was being sold to National Grid, that would not be tax exempt. There would be tax revenue there on behalf of the city. So um, using other payment in lieu of taxes agreements that have been signed across the state, you know, that there's sort of been a standard that's been set, $10,000 per megawatt. If we follow that rule of thumb, this would also offer, in a situation where we're prepaying a lease, ECA would additionally be contributing $43,056 uh, $43, per year over the term of the lease, uh, totaling, you know, a little over $850,000 in 20 years. Why don't we go back to some of the visuals here, just so this tends to be where we get a lot of questions. But, um, so just, just to provide a, a brief executive summary, what we're pro proposing that the um, school committee consider is having an RFP and potentially um, leasing out um, as an accessory use the parking lot. We wouldn't be taking any parking spots or any com other companies like us. Um, in exchange for getting a brand new parking lot and either getting cash or energy savings, all of which is at no capital cost to the school district. I just want to make that clear. We are not asking for any budgetary outlays or anything. Um, it's a one-way street where we're writing checks, not, not the other way around. And just to address, address some uh, potential safety concerns and just general aesthetics and um, easements. So the minimum clearance that we propose is at 14 feet, which is the same clearance used on Route 24. <coughs> so any snow plowing equipment that got here using the roads would have no issue plowing the lots as, as they typically do. We've done a survey around the various schools in the state and other private users of these carports. Um, in no instance was the paving price, I'm sorry, not the paving price, the snow removal price increased uh, the only thing that we found is that it either stayed the same or was reduced. A lot of instances where it stayed the same, it was purely based on the fact that the, the company doing the snow removal didn't know yet how it would be impacted. So they, you know, for the first year kept it the same, but did acknowledge that they had to remove less snow. What happens with the snow is, as you can see, um, it our panels are angled in a way that we aim to capture any snowfall up there and capture it in a way that it will not fall off. You know, it will be blown off in wind the same way, in windy situations, the same way that it would off the side of a building. Um, but you're not going to have any situations where a student comes out um, and there's some sort of avalanche off, off the top um, if it was at a, you know, a slope facing in one direction. Yeah. You know, in, in our opinion, that we believe the, um, the preliminary design we did has over 10,000 modules. It's a very large system. We believe this is the best site for solar in the city of Brockton, um, especially after the landfill was recently constructed and done um, on both the private and public level. So uh, without further ado, any further ado, we'd love to open up the floor to any questions or comments that the committee may have. At nighttime, there's lighting underneath. Yeah, so there's, um, and it's actually, it's really effective lighting. When you have, you know, the, the lamps on the poles that you see in the parking lot right now, um, they're typically, the light is thrown off in a sphere, and a lot of it's lost to the atmosphere, and that creates a lot of light pollution. In this case, we have strips of LED lighting on the underside, um, so it provides a very, you know, clear white light that's directed down at the pavement and actually illuminates your parking lot better. if there's damage. Mm -hmm. Is that something that we would be responsible for the cost? We, we would be 100% responsible for that. Um, we would carry insurance. We would have an operations and maintenance plan to cover that as well. Um, on top of having local technicians in the area already servicing our own existing you know, portfolio. So. Uh, the, the 
street in front of the administration building. Um, you said the walkways wouldn't be included. There's a strip of, um, I would say grass, not a lot of grass there, but mm. <coughs> this, is the street not included in the, this? The street is included. It yeah. is included, okay. Yes. Actually, this, this outline, and we'll, we'll distribute the um, quote from the pavers, but those black boxes are what's included in the paving, to okay. be clear. Um, it's my understanding that anything outside of that is not included in this base bit. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't mean we couldn't go back to the, the paving contractors and, and ask them to make adjustments. And I see that the uh, parking lot for the soccer field is on the border of that. Um, and that's something that would, looks like it would be half done. That would be in the, in the bottom right hand corner? Yeah, in the bottom right hand corner. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, no, we, we'd certainly be interested in being more inclusive and bringing more in yeah. to the extent. Because that's needed. been an issue over there for a while. It floods and parents are parking on dirt. It, would, it looks like you'd cover probably half of it, so I think it would probably be a matter of going out 30 feet maybe. Okay. Um, so that's something I think that we should explore. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. We'd, we'd be certainly more awesome. willing to do that. I, th I think financially the, the biggest element that's not included in the paving scope of work goes back to the... Um, the sidewalks and the curbs. Um, we haven't been given an exact number on that, but with all the, um, you know, handicap access elements and ADA elements, we do think it's a fairly significant number. So, if, just to clarify, so if, if the committee wanted to take the next step, um, we certainly have to discuss um, this project with uh, the mayor and you know City Hall, Mr. Nezarella, Mr. Condon, because uh, there's a lot of obviously financial pieces, and then of course um, Mr. Morris, because something a project like this, if we would have choose to go forward, has to go out to bid. Um, so uh, you know there there's there are many pieces to the uh, to the puzzle. However, I think it was a certainly a, a very uh, worthwhile proposal for the committee to consider and I definitely uh, wanted all of us to you know see what um, was discussed with myself and Mr. Thomas. I, I just think it's something that we at this certainly at this time with uh, you know limited funds and uh, the potential for you know a capital improvement such as you know the, you know, the paving of the parking lot which we all know is well overdue um, you know, and perhaps, you know, some revenue or, you know, another um, option with, with regard to, you know, energy consumption on, on our part. Um, you know, those, those certainly are things that will have to be um, discussed and ironed out with um, our finance people who sort of certainly know uh, better in terms of what, uh, what would be the better financial proposal. Um, but um, I really uh, think this was a great, uh, you know, presentation and I'm so glad that you gentlemen you know are interested and I, I think you know I speak on behalf of the committee that we certainly uh, you know want to mull this over and consider it and have further discussion with the mayor and uh, you know his team downtown um, because I think like um, like the uh, Rocky statue the the school committee because it's on school grounds you know has to make uh, a decision but it's still you know, a city property. So the city certainly um, you know, is a major player in this whole equation as well. So um, you know, it's, it's a, a two-pronged, well actually three-pronged because of, of course the thing with the bidding and all that good stuff. But, but uh, again, I, I think that I really wanted you guys to all you know, see what was presented to us because I think it's something that is worthwhile both, both from an environmental standpoint and also you know, perhaps a financial benefit to our community and certainly the students here at the high school. So, just I'd, I'd like to add just two more things that uh, sort of got lost. Um, another addition that we, you know, like to bring forth is uh, certainly educational kiosks that we would set up around, you know, or either around the school or in one central location that would be able to educate the students on, you know, what the array was doing, both for the environment. Um, in terms of carbon dioxide offset, uh, how that carbon dioxide offset equated to, you know, number of cars taken off the road, number of homes powered, 
trees planted, et cetera. And then beyond that, ECA would, you know, one way or another, we'd, we'd like to continue our educational outreach that uh, we started last fall uh, in presenting to the George School and, you know, work with the school's STEM programs to, you know, either develop a curriculum or, you know, or, you know other, other educational resources that we could really use this, this project to educate the students and um, put them to work. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then I guess, you know, second, we didn't come here expecting, you know, all we're really asking for is just that this pro this be considered for an RFP. We know that uh, when it comes down to it, we have to be, you know, competitive and the best bid in an open public environment. And uh, we feel that with the money that we've raised from, you know, a local electrical union pension fund, we uh, both can put, you know, local unions and local labor work um, and provide a lot of money to the Boston Public Schools. Brockton. Not Brockton Public <laughs> Schools, sorry. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Oh, one, one quick question. At the end of the shelf life of the 20-year lease, what happens? We're, we're responsible for removal. We, the system certainly has more. It's, it's made of galvanized steel, so it certainly has more than a 20-year useful life. We would like to extend that should the city be willing and able to consider such. But um, to make it 100% clear, it is our equipment and is our financial obligation to remove such equipment. Um, so normally towards the end of the term, there's some type of springing financial surety or some type of bond, letter of credit, something like that, to ensure that uh, parties like ourselves are motivated to remove the equipment. <laughs> um, so. But the warranty on the uh, the actual steel structure that's being put up has a 30-year warranty and the modules themselves have a 25-year warranty so you know everything will still be well within warranty at the end of our lease term so ECA would have you know a lot of incentive to you know reach back out to Brockton Public Schools and um, you know negotiate a lease extension. Are you located in our school districts presently? The majority of, of our projects so far have been on, like such as Brockton as an example, uh, 560 Oak Street and 1010 West Chestnut are in large privately, a uh, lot of major commercial industrial systems. We do have school districts and towns and cities which are power purchasers, um, such as the town of Weymouth, um, the city of Somerville. Um, we're also working with colleges such as Stonehill College. So they have these in their parking lots at their school districts? We're, well, we have our systems on privately owned sites, but we sell the power to them remotely, yeah. not so on their property. I think my question was going to be, and I, you know, I can see the structures. Um, we, of course, live in New England and the bad winter. You know, we work with our DPW to get our schools open very quickly, and I, yeah. I was looking at that wondering about plowing. Yes. And yes. being able to really move quickly yeah. in a yeah, parking so lot. So um, we feel, and, and we've reached out to other schools such as Lincoln Sudbury and Wayland um, with that exact same question. In, in no circumstance have, have we heard any feedback that this negatively impacted their, their ability to plow. Um, and they have them on site at their school. They're, they're on site, like Al almost yeah. essentially exactly as we're proposing. I mm -hmm. believe in Wayland they have um, a lower clearance than we're proposing. But they don't have the, the lot size that you do. Um, you know, the machinery that you use to clear this parking lot is certainly a lot more significant than what you know Wayland is using. Uh, so we we took that in mind and, and didn't want to be restrictive at all to whoever is plowing your your lots. So if I, if I could add a couple of things, um, you know, I've had a chance to take a look at this also, and uh, you know, I. I I think it's something that we ought to be seriously considering on a number of fronts. Um, first of all, I don't think anyone knows better than we do the financial constraints that we're under budget-wise uh, with the school budget, and we've got to look for opportunities for additional revenue, um, and particularly in this case, as an opportunity for a major capital improvement and some revenue. Uh, the parking lot is in horrible condition, and in our current budget situation, it's unlikely we're going to have any money in the budget in the foreseeable future uh, to invest in a parking lot. Uh, so I, I think that that immediately is of some interest. Um, 
plus the additional revenue. So one of the things that Tom alluded to is the fact that technically, I mean, this is city property and the funds would have to come to the city. Um, but I've made the commitment that if we do proceed with this, any revenue that's generated by this, the, the city would pass through to the school budget over and above whatever that year's allocation was. So, you know, the intent here would be that if the project goes on school property, that the revenue that would be generated from it, the benefit from it, would come directly to, um, to the school department. Uh, this is also a very good fit for us in terms of our earning a green community designation last year and a number of the other projects that we've got going on in the city, including one with the schools that's getting ready to launch right now, which held about a half a million dollars of energy conservation improvements in 10 different schools that's being funded by a, a state grant that we were able to uh, earn in partnership with the schools through the green community program. Uh, the gentleman mentioned the solar field we've opened up up at the Thatcher Street landfill, which is generating about a quarter of a million dollars to the city mm -hmm. for solar panels that went on a closed landfill that had no useful purpose, a brown field. Um, and even uh, for folks that live in the city can see that we're in the process of uh, installing 9,000 LED lights across the city, including all the outdoor lighting on all the school campuses. So this would fit with a number of other initiatives that we already have underway in terms of saving money and, and also reducing our carbon footprint and being a green community. So um, I think as Tom mentioned, there's some more conversation to be had. Um, and I think that uh, as the guys from ECA mentioned, that if we do decide to go forward, this, we're going to have to consult with the procurement officer and I believe probably have an RFP go out uh, that this firm would be looking to respond to. But there is a parking, uh, there is a solar parking canopy over at Stonehill, obviously not as big as this, but if you want to see what it looks like, and particularly at night, uh, it is very well lit at night and it's aesthetically pleasing. It, it's, uh, you know, I, I think this is thinking forward a little bit in terms of uh, uh, energy conservation and uh, saving money for the school district at the same time. And particularly if this were an opportunity to address a long overdue need of needing a new parking lot at the, here at the high school campus. So, um, Tom, I don't know if, if you want to take any type of action tonight, or you just want to um, schedule a meeting. Uh, I'm open for comment, but I mean, if, if uh, I suppose the school committee could indicate a, an interest in us pursuing it and, and continuing to. Do we have a consensus from the committee that we should move forward with respect to uh, a little more, you know, due diligence and discussion on the city side with. You know, obviously we'll need some input from Attorney Nazarella and from a financial standpoint from Mr. Condon and obviously Mr. Morris as well. So, I mean, I don't see a downside in, in trying to move this to the next step to open this up for a further discussion on with the, the powers that be at City Hall that need to be uh, included. Your choice. Actually, um, thank you for the presentation. Um, a few years back, I remember some of us on the accounts review, we approached um, Mr. Petronio and we asked him about solar panels on the schools. And I think this is a creative way of bringing the solar panels onto our school property. There was an issue, I believe, with the roof or um, you, you just, sure, they, sure. Had ac they needed access and things. Yeah. Uh, I would definitely want to get a little more info because I know that other solar companies put liens on properties and we're talking about 20 years from now and um, you know, Brockton High needs a good facelift, or we need, we need, so definitely, I think it's great, but we do need more info. So why don't we do this? Why don't we make a motion then to, um, uh, for further consultation and collaboration with uh, uh, the city, city hall, uh, the city side, um, for a little more due diligence uh, in terms of what is uh, required and what um, 
uh, needs to be further considered for a project of this uh, nature and magnitude. I mean, so we're not committing to a, a vote, but we're committing to pursue it further for a little more due diligence from, uh, from the city side and to get their perspective on um, you know, this type of uh, uh, an investment. I think the direction would be moving uh, towards potentially issuing an RFP because yeah. that's where we would be going. Lisa. Before we would be um, putting out an RFP, we would have a cost or an estimate of what it would cost to do the walkways and the sidewalks. Would that be one of the very yeah, first I mean, every, steps? Everything's on the table. Yeah, we can provide that. We've, we've made that request already. And I think that would be an important piece yeah. that people would want to know what are we paying um, yeah. for that part before we really talked about putting out the RFP. But right. I do love the idea. Yeah, and, thank you. Um, I think you did a great presentation. I think it's a very creative way for us to look at um, getting some funds and educating our students and being environmentally responsible. So thank yeah. you very much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. We've got to think outside the box a little bit. We, we see the budget constraints that uh, we're going to be operating under for the foreseeable future. So basically, I, what I, I think I'm proposing is perhaps a, uh, a motion uh, for, for uh, further consultation with our, our city hall counterparts. Um, to do further due diligence on this, um, on, on this type of a proposal. Um, we're not obviously voting to approve the particular project yet, but we are moving it forward to further consult with uh, uh, the city side and um, get more details like you mentioned, uh, Ms. Azak. So I would make a motion to, uh, to move this um, uh, to the, the city side uh, for further consultation and discussion on the uh, parameters and requirements of a pro project such as a solar um, parking lot or solar field at uh, Brockton High School. And how about then a report back to the school committee yeah, after and, that? Okay, and the, that, that, that uh, discussion and consultation needs to be reported back to the school committee for further review. Second. Motions are made and properly seconded. All in favor? Approved unanimously. Gentlemen, thank you very much thank for you. a great thank presentation, you. You and we're looking thank forward you. to continue to work on this with you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, I want to invite our uh, student uh, report. It's Shama Erase. Shama, you're in the countdown. What day are you at? Uh, I think it's 30s, in the 30s. Really? Yes. I know my friends are counting down, but I lost track. <laughs> But, um, well, to start off, speaking of college and graduating stuff, I just wanted to do a shout out to some of my, um, my um, peers that got into great schools. Um, I know the IV's decisions came out on Wednesday, I think, and um, I know Nicole got into Harvard, and someone in my class named Deborah got in um, to Dartmouth, so I'm very happy for them. Um, my friend Jerrica got into West Point, and I, that was her dream school, so that was great. And another friend of mine got a full ride to Emmanuel, so I'm very proud of my class. Um, but on other news, um, there's the music department's hosting a spring concert on April 4th and um, a trip to D.C. Um, I know you guys approved that and many of my friends were selling tickets so that they could pay their half to go and most of the students did get to go and raise enough money um, by doing raffles. They were very dedicated. They sold it to basically everyone at the school. Um, college fairs um, are, I think it's next week, um, April 11th and senior things like scholarship applications and um, AP IV testing uh, is coming up soon. Um, scholarship applications have gone out and some of them are already due, so time's ticking. Um, MCAS was last week for sophomores and next month. And senior week, very fun, where we get to dress up and uh, celebrate the fact that we are seniors, um, is next week before vacation. Uh, this week, this month, actually, is Autism Awareness Month, and I know that um, Boxer Buddies was selling blue t-shirts, um, and they continu continue to sell them, and they're planning on having an activity um, with a collaboration with Key Club, so I'll keep you posted on that. Um, there's a blood drive that's being planned um, by 
Mr. Kelly and Key Club, so I will also keep you informed on that. And um, um, what did I say? <laughs> the Feminist Club hosted the Women's Conference, and um, they, they're talking about making it an annual thing, so that's exciting. And Upward Bound is going on their trip to DC over April vacation, including visiting colleges like Howard and Georgetown um, and University of Maryland, and visiting a lot of museums down in DC because DC is pretty famous for their beautiful museums, so that would be a great learning experience. And um, tomorrow, the spring, teams have their first games, so softball and baseball. That's excellent, and we are so proud of you mentioned your friends so graciously, and we're so excited when we see the terrific colleges our students get accepted to each and every year. Yeah. So hopefully they realize many of their dreams and we'll continue to watch them go through their remaining months here. We're so proud of you know, all of their activities. Uh, one of the things that you did bring up, and we're actually gonna be having a presentation by our special education department, and I did bring a picture of, it is Autism Speaks, Autism Awareness, and this was our nursing staff that was also working, I believe, with one of the um, classroom teachers and paras. The kids actually designed the t-shirts, and they had sold uh, well over, I think, 225 shirts as of yesterday, so very proud of, uh, of supporting that, that terrific event for our kids here in Brockton. So thank you very much, Shama. And next, I would like to bring up uh, Laurie Mason, our Director of Special Education, and tonight you'll be getting both a presentation uh, by our CPAC, and I will have Laurie introduce our parent. And uh, under Mass General Laws, there is an opportunity every year for a parent to present to the school committee to talk about special education needs or challenges or things that they feel you should hear from a parent's perspective. You'll then have a presentation uh, by Laurie Mason, again on our special education department and some of the uh, strengths and again some of the challenges that we face uh, during this past year. So we're going to move. Yeah. I'm just trying to figure. <laughs> Not um, yep, I'm almost there. But I think I'll, um, I'm going to introduce Terry McIntosh. She is um, the Vice President of the CPAC. I've known Terry for a very long time. I actually had her son, who's going to be 30, um, when I was taught first grade at the Downey School. So I want to introduce Terry. Good evening. Thank you for having me this evening. Um, it is a pleasure to sit on the Special Needs PAC. I am the Vice President. Um, the president of our PAC, Michelle Keene, is not with us this evening, um, but the two of us feel very strongly in representing all the parents and the students of Brockton, and special, especially the special education parents and the students. Um, first of all, I want to thank um, Brockton City Hall, the mayor, I guess, maybe behind this. Um, Last night I was doing errant from the east side of Brockton. I live on the west side and I was going through downtown Brockton and I had a very proud moment as a parent. Um, the city hall clock was lit up blue for autism awareness and as a mother I was like, oh, Brockton kids count. And I was very, very impressed with that and I want to thank whoever was responsible for that. <laughs> that was a great feeling that to me Brockton children do count and I know that all of you have the best interest in heart as well. Um, we've had a very positive um, year this year. I want to thank Laurie Mason, Director of Special Ed. Um, our first meeting with the parents that we invited in November, Laurie, not just Laurie, but the entire, her entire staff, the department heads, their staff, all represented themselves to these parents at the Special Ed meeting. There must have been 40, 45 parents there. And it, they were so touched that all of these, you know, department heads came out and they made themselves so visible and I've been, you know, I see parents in the parking lot, a pickup, a drop off, and they're like, you know what? I got to talk to this department head. It was so nice that they came and I got to see that face. But I really have to say this past particular year, I have seen such a strong input from Department of Special Ed and I can't thank Laurie enough 
Um, as we all know, she has a very open door policy, and I feel that that is rubbing off to all of her department heads and the staff beneath them. Um, I will tell you one of the main things that the parents were very concerned and wanted to learn, learn about this year was the transition from you know, elementary school going into junior high, junior high going into high school. Um, Laurie did a great job getting her department heads to get this together. We're in the process of doing it now. And I was pleasantly surprised that I have, my children are much younger, pre preschool, that they're doing the same thing for the preschool level into kindergarten. So I will be going to that on Thursday. So there's been a lot going on that the parents wanted to see happen, and, it, and it's happened. So I'm very, very happy to bring that to you. And um, another reason um, I wanted to come and speak tonight is to talk about what a year does or changes. I was sitting in front of you all last year, not on the PAC, but as a very, very concerned parent of leaving the Gilmore School to the Barrett Russell. Believe me, you all listen to me if you wanted to or not, but I, I was one of the parents not for it. And as they say, as the dog comes with the tail between their legs, that's me. Um, I will be honest, first day of school, I was like, oh my God, what am I going to do? I have never been welcomed to a school. I, I, the principal, Joanne Camello, and the department head of special ed, Ginny Lundstrom, I don't know if you're aware of what they did. If I tell you it went flawless, I mean, I'm a parent. There's things that I'm sure didn't go flawless <laughs> with the parking, whatever. But it <clears throat> has been a year that I can't even tell you anything but positive. Those two individuals with their staff and the teachers and the parents and every person in that school made this problem that we thought was going to be so traumatic for the students and for the parents, but a lot of you had hope and you said it will work out, the superintendent, Laurie, all we, you don't, we'll get through it. But it has been up here, and I just want to take a moment to thank those individuals because we all know with the strong leadership, your team beneath you has positive, positive energy, and that's what that school and that staff has brought every single day to the students and the parents. The, that door is opened every single morning with the smile on that principal's face, like, I don't know where she gets it from. <laughs> she, lead, she knows every student, she knows every parent. The parking, I'll be honest with you, I drive my children to school. I was like, how am I gonna do this? One goes to the Downey, one goes to Barrett Russell. Everyone's missed somebody there, and Miss Dawn, the custodian's out there, she's got everyone in order, <laughs> and she's done a wonderful job. So then I have to pick them up, and I pick Christopher up first, the Barrett Russell, and I have to get myself very quickly over to the Downey. And it's not the Barrett Russell parking problem we have, it's me getting to the, by all the other schools to get to the Downey. So hats off to the staff from the Barrett Russell, from the top, right from the top, the, all the staff. I just wanna tell you that if I gave you a hard time last year, I'm very sorry, but <laughs> thank you. And I think they, you all know how hard they all work. I don't need to say anything else, but thank you very much. That's it for me. On a positive <laughs> note, I'm here this year. <laughs> all right, well, I won't be too long. So every year I come and present and I talk about my program, so I thought I would change it up a little bit and talk about where special ed has come over the past year. So looking at last year, this year, our enrollment for special ed has increased. Um, we have, and this slide will just kind of will outline, we had 171 new registrations from June 28th till March 27th of new kids moving into Brockton Public Schools that had IEPs. And actually, from March 27th to today, I think I had about 10 more. Um, parents are moving to Brockton for the special education <coughs> programs, and I'm not saying that because I'm the director, that's what parents are telling us at Parent Information, that's what they're saying when they, oh, Sorry, <laughs> I'm really loud, I don't know why. <laughs> um, so, you know, they've come in to move into the city of Brockton, and, and that's what they say, they, they've heard we've had some really great programs. I'm not gonna read all the numbers, but we have had a lot of movement within our own district of students needing more restrictive settings, needing special education. 
537 initial evaluations is probably the highest. And when I say initial evaluations, parents writing letters concerned that their students are struggling, teachers concerned that their that students are struggling. That's a really large number. So we've had teams in schools, and this is preschool to high school, evaluating students. And we have increased our special education numbers based on just those initial evals itself. We've, we've placed students in all of our programs, kids that are in gen ed, moving into specialized programs, um, students who are not, have not received any services. Now we have about 220 new students receiving what we call our MSN services, and that's kindergarten through 12th grade. Um, we have seen an influx at the high school level of evaluations. Um, we've had a lot of kids moving into Brockton, um, and we had a lot of parent requests for evaluations. Preschool is our, is our rolling admission. So we have had a lot of evaluations, like 63 initial placements right now. Um, we're placing 33 students in our substantially separate and 33 integrated preschool placements. Then we have a list of preschool students that come in for services only, that they do require some type of specialized instruction. They may come in for a speech group. They might come in for occupational therapy. I didn't even include those numbers because it, we have a lot of preschoolers. We're, we're noticing the increase in preschool because we have such fabulous programs. So basically the budget impact is that the more students with disabilities that we qualify, the programs, we're going to need to add programs because our programs are growing. Um, and due to state requirements for compliance, we're definitely going to need to increase those programs. I feel that we have a really, um, we look at um, high staff student ratio. I, we want to make sure in the special education department that we provide students with a free appropriate public education. We ensure that they're getting what they need. Um, we always base all our, um, and that we base our analysis on their independence, social skills, social emotional, academic, skill set and obviously safety. So our, I do have a high staff student ratio. Some of our programs will have 12 students, a teacher, and maybe four additional staff. The staff is needed because the students need to have that much support. Um, I do foresee that for next year that I'm going to be needing to add positions because our enrollment in special ed is increasing. Um, and also, as we have our team chairs running meetings, they're, they're running six to seven meetings a day, which is a lot of meetings when you want to make sure that every parent has an opportunity to speak. So I've asked them not to run that many. I want them only to run five meetings a day to give parents an opportunity. But given the fact that we've had some snow days and half days, and it's really hard for us to make sure we fit all the evaluations in before the end of the school year. Um, an additional team chair and our related service providers, which is speech and OT, We'll, I'll be requesting additional support just for compliance alone. The numbers are really, um, when you put them on paper, like I knew the numbers were high because I, I get reports every month from our team chairs and from the special ed department heads, but when you really put it down on paper, you're like, wow, our, we have really increased our enrollment. Um, so I want to talk about, Terry talked about the um, Barrett Russell, I want to talk about the Herod Huntington Therapeutic Day School, which has been a great success. We've been able to bring two more additional students back from out of district um, placements because we're, we're bringing them back into that program at an elementary level so that we did the cost of the, the placement and then transportation. I had four students that were Brockton Public Schools, School students that we placed there on extended evaluations for a cost savings because typically we did not have that venue last year because of the size of the guarded school and the staffing, I wasn't able to send students there who were at Brockton High School or a champion or in a middle school to be able to go over there for an evaluation. Now I, I was sending them out of district for 45 day placement which was costing money. Now I, this year we had four students placed there. And then through the team process, I had six additional students within the Brockton schools placed there through the team process, which, which allowed us, because we have the capacity now to support more students. So. Just for this beginning, you know, for this year, we've saved about $196,000. I continue to work with Michelle Lana, who's the Auditor District Coordinator. We always talk about bringing students back to the Brockton Public Schools. When parents request, I want a 45-day placement outside of the city of Brockton, we recommend the Huntington Therapeutic Day School. We bring them on a tour. We have them meet with the teachers. They meet with therapeutic support staff. We talk about having the kids stay in the district. 
we talk about having them, giving them what they need right here in the Brockton Public Schools. Um, two years ago, it was about two years ago we had our program review, um, our coordinated program review through the Department of Ed. One of the things that we needed to do was a program review on special education programs. So we broke it down into a three year process. So in 2016 and 17 it was Brockton High School, the Goddard, which is now the Huntington and the Key Center. We hired um, Lindsay Fallon who works out of UMass Boston to come in and do our program review and she had graduate students assisting her. We interviewed Prince administration, general education teachers, and special ed teachers. And the goal of the program was to really look at, does the Brockton Public Schools provide, what kind of special education programs do they provide? And it was a series of interviews and observations. Um, so the first year we did these three schools, and there were some positives that came out of, you know, positive findings, but we always areas of concern that we looked at. The thread of the concerns were, really looking at the lack of resources, curriculum, behavioral supports. And I, we did, this is the first year we did, we did the alternative schools in the high school. Um, and then we, I'm gonna kind of skip that action plan because then we went to the middle schools this year. And it's the same thread that's through, common thread is, the teachers are looking for more support staff, smaller class size, as you know, resources and curriculum. And this is just not for special education, this is overall gen ed. Um, there are some things that the special education department along with um, teaching and learning we can put to work together to provide professional development. We're already providing professional development for staff. Behavioral support systems, that seems to be a thread in, in the program. We have PBIS that the special education department supports and funds, so we can, we can definitely expand that program. Um, you know, Teachers want smaller class size, they feel like they don't have enough support staff. These are just threads that we want to make sure that I put them up there. I am working with um, June's department um, to talk about consistency and curriculum and, and really talk about the resources and making sure that we're all in the same playing field. Um, but what I, thought was, what I thought was good that came out of this is that we're really looking at gen ed teachers and what their responses were to special education because they're in, they're in the classrooms, they have students with disabilities in front of them, they need to know all about the IEP because they're still responsible. Other questions that came out and other answers that came out of the program review really lent itself to where the district is trying to move. Consistent resources, curriculum, trying to make sure that we're all on the same page. This next year we're going to be, I'm, not, I'm skipping the action plan right now. Then we're going to continue with our elementary, elementary programs in 18-19. Um, we are up for a mid-cycle review, so they'll be coming, the Department of Ed will be coming out in the fall to, to look at some of our programs, to review our program review, to, to interview and meet with some administration and talk about where we were three years ago till today. We have made a lot of improvements. Um, Three years ago, we didn't have a lot of things that we were at a deficit. Um, we have made a lot of changes. I think that if, last year was a big one about moving the Huntington Therapeutic Day School because that was one of the things that came up in the review was about equity and resources. And we've done a lot. Of, we've turned around some of those things. So I'm not. I'm really looking forward for them to come to the district to see what what we've done. Um, I'm working with um, other districts to tuition students into the Huntington School. Um, when it was the Goddard, I did have some districts request that and we did tuition students in. This year I wanted to kind of hold off and let us get our feet wet and get established before we started bringing students in from other communities, but I have been approached by um, several communities around us to have their, their students come to us. And as I said, we're going to monitor that out of district um, student progress to determine the least restrictive environment. Michelle Lanner was a department head in the middle schools before she became the adage or coordinator, so she already, she's always looking about bringing the students back. Um, and that's what our goal is, to bring kids back to the Brockton Public Schools, to provide them exactly what they need. Short and sweet. Um, does anyone have any questions? I have a question. Yep. I talked very fast, so I was like, oh, <laughs> sorry. Thank you okay. um, for a lot of information. Um, and also I want to echo how wonderful Joanne Camillo is, so. <laughs> but, um, I have a question about the program review findings. Yes. 
was that done? Is that the Department of Education's findings, or is that our? It's our, our findings. So okay. we had Lindsay Fallon and her team came out. We set up schedules and interviews. She has generated a report, and I'm in the process. I, I met with um, Jay Lander at the Huntington. I met with Cindy Burns from the Keith, and I have set up a meeting with Cliff, but I had, I had to cancel that, so now I have to reschedule that with Cliff to go over the Brockton High findings. I had already met with Sharon previously and talked about the findings, and I'm setting up the middle school principal. So that's our findings, okay. but we have to submit our program review to the Department of Ed, and they're going to review it. Great. So, which is, you know, it's a good thing. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. Does anybody else have any questions? Yes. Just a, a comment <clears throat> um, relative to the move to the Barrett Russell. Um, I just want to say I was glad you and other parents like you came and brought that feedback to us. Um, so don't apologize for that at all, ever, because what that enabled us to do is ask the right questions of administration, and you would bring you and other parents would bring us concerns, and we. Okay, how are you going to address that? What are we going to do about that? You know, so we knew what questions to ask and what concerns had to be addressed in order to make that transition smooth. And even when we took a tour just before it opened, um, I know myself and Ms. Plant and others had several things that because of the feedback we had gotten from all of you, where when we walked through, well, is that, that's not done yet, is that going to be done for opening? I mean, there were several things that, so you really helped us make sure that things happen mm -hmm. to, you know, that were in place and ready. Um, so I, I, I appreciate that you guys came and, and brought all those concerns so that we knew what needed to be done. Thank you. I want to make Probably. one more comment about the Barrett Russell. So I think that last year we, there was a concern about the evaluation team. What, you know, because they, at the Gilmore they had a lot of space. So we had moved that evaluation team to the Adult Learning Center. It has probably been the most effective process that we have for parents. We're able to give parents many opportunities to come and have their students evaluated. But it's a team approach. I have, there's a team over there that they're housed there. They're, they contact parents. They do all the evaluations. The team meetings are run there. We have a play group over there. There's a preschool over there that we're able to bring kids in to do play groups there to evaluate them that way. Um, that has really allowed us to do a really strong analysis of how many preschool students we actually get in and what evaluations take place. So that has been really positive. Um, June and I went over and met with the team like the first week. And we, we also had a lot of questions ourselves because it was a new process, but it really has worked out really well and um, it's given us an opportunity to really look at that process much better, much closer. How are we for space at the preschool? So yes, we're saying that our our, yep. um, our students are our influxes. Yeah. So growing. right now, um, Jenny Lundstead, who was the department head, oversees the the evaluations. We have um, I do still have seats available at the Barrett Russell. We have team meetings projected. Um, so we're hoping that we are, we're going to be looking at it by mid-May to hopefully make sure we have enough seats for the rest of the school year. Right now, we have enough seats. Okay. Because but the enrollment is really, um, the evaluations, we're, we're, we're doing a lot of evaluations. We have a lot of students entering Massachusetts, Brockton from other countries, and we have a lot of little kids, a lot of little guys, three and four and five years old, who have never been to school, obviously never been to school, so we're really using that as our arena to do the evaluations. So right now we're good, we have enough seats. We'll wait to see what happens in mid-May. <laughs> nice presentation. Um, nice. Do you think that next year, by moving over to the Huntington, there'll be even um, more opportunity to expand the program? Yes, I think that we really, um, I mean, I had several communities reach out to me um, to bring students' intuition in, and I, I just felt like at that point we needed to kind of hold back and, and let me get the program established. Um, the students do really well at the Huntington. Um, we're looking to, I'm looking to add different types of programming over there to, uh, to increase the enrollment and to really bring more kids back from out of district. I definitely see an increase in the enrollment. Um, the students, you know, they want to be at Brockton High, but everybody wants to be at Brockton High. Um, but we try to, we're trying to give them more opportunities 
at the Huntington for them to want, you know, to say, yeah, this is where I want to be. I want to be at the Huntington School. We have kids graduating. We have kids going on to college, and that's and that's huge. That's really a positive. So my goal is to bring more kids to to grow that program. Great. I would also like to thank you for coming forward. <laughs> um, you know, giving us your perspective on how things are working out over at the Barrett Russell. Um, thank you. It's a very, very, very positive. Children come up with big smiles on their face, and that's all I need to see. Yeah. It tells you a lot. It wasn't an easy decision mm -hmm. for the committee. Correct. Um, I mean, you certainly saw the environment that we were working with, and, and there were certainly a lot of emotions um, and concerned parents, and rightly so. Mm -hmm. So, you know, for you to come back and you know tell us that um, things are working out, uh, Very well. you know, makes us obviously feel, you know, not thrilled with what we had to do, but better that um, we work together um, with the superintendent and her team and all of the hardworking, you know, Brockton Public School staff that um, prepared the building both physically, um, you know, our uh, craftsmen who made the changes and had to make quite a few changes, uh, you know, with um, Mr. Thomas's, you know, supervision and cooperation and all the, you know, fine, uh, you know, talented people that can do things that uh, I certainly can't with the hammer and nails and all that good stuff. Um, and, um, you know, all the people from um, the administration, your friend who's sitting right next to you, uh, you know, Mrs. Saber and everyone, the other teachers that um, put, I guess, what you would say is their professionalism Correct. above and beyond their desire to stay where they were um, right. because the kids come first, you know, for all of us, for everyone on the school committee, for everyone down at Central, and for everyone out in the schools. Mm -hmm. um, the kids are our priority, so you know, I just want to say thanks because it was a very um, emotional time for, for everyone on both <laughs> both sides. So. And now this June I'll be leaving very emotional, leaving the Barrett Russell crying, so <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Well, I'm glad it's sort of tears of joy, then yeah, tears correct. of sort of misery and sorrow. <laughs> exactly. So, so <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Judy. Thank you for the presentation. I just wanted um, the committee to note that even though the enrollment figures um, has gone down, but in special ed it is increasing. Yes. And that will cost us more for the budget and everything else that you're going to need with the cheer person and service providers and paras and everything else that goes with it for compliance. But very good presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Sullivan. Thank you, Lori. Nice presentation. And nice report, both, both of you. I was just wondering at the, the Huntington, mm -hmm. you were talking about the tuition yes. for out of? For like, students out of Brockton, yes. Out of Brockton? Yeah. Would it, how does that get decided? In other words, so, how much is it? So a district will contact me. So when, we, when the students were at the Goddard, we probably had four students who were already attending the Goddard school who moved to a different community. So the special ed director would call and say, Are they, can they stay there? We'll tuition them in. Um, we, look at a, we look at a day rate, and that's how we charge them per, it's per day um, over the course of 180 days. Um, I haven't, like I haven't done it this year. Last year I think I had four students. I don't have I can I don't have the exact figures, but I can get them to you. Well, I was wondering, like, do you use the Chapter Seventy figure? So I went through our attorney, Paige Tobin, to came up with you know she researched other communities, and that's that's the we came up with the day rate according to what other urban directors are using for their day rates. Well, I, so I don't know. <laughs> I can get that information for you. Yeah, if you could. Yeah, yeah. And I, it's such a large school. I was wondering. Do you have plans on filling that school up? Or? So um, right now we service our emotional impaired population. Right. We do have another population in the district. We have students that are, are autistic students who also have some behavioral difficult challenges. Um, I have applied to allow us to open a classroom at the Huntington to service those students. And I also, we have our students in our life skills classes that are, 
sometimes have really a difficult time. Um, in a classroom of 10 or 12 students, they need to be in a much smaller class setting. Right, right. So I've also applied to be able to add a classroom there. Though That would prevent me from putting kids out of district and bringing, I probably have three students right now out of district that I could bring back. But at this point, they're in a classroom of six students and an out of district placement. I need to be able to replicate that at the Huntington Day School. The, um, I did apply for it, it looks like it's gonna go through. So I'd be able to add a couple of more classrooms. Um, but that's the goal is to increase the, because it is a large school, you know, it's a large building, but it's allowing for our students with our emotional families to really get, really benefit from a better right. education. Yeah, yeah. And we need to bring in some vocational opportunities for the kids there, and that's something that Jay Lander and I are working on, trying to figure out a vocational program for the kids, because that's part of the day school application that we provide a day, a vocational opportunities. So we're really trying to figure out what works, what makes sense. Um, he's talking about like small machinery and things like that, and I, I'm like, oh, so I have no idea. So I would have to, we're gonna really try to investigate that and then try to find grants to fund that. I just wanted to add that the $200,000 that you're saving yep. is fabulous. It's in my pocket, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Nice job, thank, thank you. you. Laurie, Mrs. Nakash, thank you so much thank uh, you. for the presentation. Thank you for noticing the blue lights. I sure night. did. Right. Thank you very much for that. Thank you. You'll be very pleased that at our uh, next, I believe it's our first meeting in May, we've actually invited the Barrett Russell to come and present to you. I wanted you to see a year in. Um, we just did our visit, uh, our leadership team visit about a week ago. Uh, we all commented on just what a happy place it was. You know, the children are well adjusted, doing wonderful, wonderful things there. Um, you know, it's just a great place to be. Uh, Joanne Camillo was doing an excellent job with professional development with staff, as uh, Laurie Mason talked about, along with Mrs. McIntosh, the transition pieces are happening. So when children are leaving there, there's connections with the teachers from the Barrett Russell to their teachers in their kindergarten classes throughout the district. So um, again, we, we are pleased. Uh, we're seeing a lot of progress, and I really do think that they've found a home. You know, when you go there, and again, I think we all were there in the beautiful fall weather when we had the playground uh, rededicated. So um, it, ver it very much is their home, and, and hopefully they'll be there for a long time, and we'll continue to support it. And as Laurie just told you, uh, the coordinated program review allows a district to look internally uh, along with obviously the state looking in to make sure that our children are getting the best services possible. It's a continuation of constant improvement and that's what we will continue to do. Uh, we actually have a request from um, a school district to come and visit and specifically wants to visit our special education department and talk to us and that's going to be the Lawrence Public Schools this coming I believe the end of April the 27th of April, so they will have a team here. It's actually some of their school committee members, so I'll be talking to you a little bit further about that. But we will show them and talk to them about some of our challenges and some of the things that we've been able to certainly solve as, uh, as a school committee and school district. So moving on, um, I just mentioned to the mayor, as far as the budget update, we are in such initial stages. Uh, what I will say is exactly what we had at our finance committee meeting, uh, just a, a brief overview of um, in looking at um, our initial work, if we were to have a level services budget, and as I said, we don't have state figures, we don't have city figures, this is very initially us going in and taking a look at the budget that continues to be struggling um, in meeting our obligations to students. So we are looking at with um, $168 million, and that would be, again, the increases uh, for this year to have the same level of services would be about a $6.7 million deficit. What we did today was we recommended in what I'm calling round one, we identified about $3 million of savings in that particular budget. But again, I want to caution everybody, you heard me mention the superintendent's budget. That is my job to advise the school committee of what I feel we need going forward because there are going to be some difficult choices. One of the things you just heard Laurie mention is as we watch our special education programs grow or our population programs grow, there were additional positions in there. You know, so again, something is going to have to give if we're going to be looking at meeting compliance. That's not only with special education, that's with bilingual education, uh, that's with making sure 
you know, again, that we have reasonable class sizes, that we're able to give our students the education that we feel our urban students, you know, deserve. And on that note, um, also, I want to remind everybody that I'm very proud of Brockton, and Brockton is at the forefront of advocacy in this area. And this has not been an easy job. We've certainly, and it hasn't just been talking the past couple of years. There have been things going on in the background with our attorneys, uh, with our urban counterparts, uh, with mayors across the state, talking about the struggles of many, many school districts, not just urbans. You've got some suburbans, and you certainly have some rurals. But I will tell you that this uh, Thursday evening, uh, I'm joined by uh, the mayor. Um, I believe a number of school committee members are going to Worcester, uh, Aldo Petronio, and we are presenting at the um, Worcester School Committee meeting along with their mayor and school committee, and we're going to be talking about the tale of two cities. And we will compare budgets, and we will talk about what the challenges are as we go forward and continue to um, have outreach to develop our coalitions. And when you uh, talk about the Globe article that was out there, you heard me talk about it last time we met. But one thing is very certain, we are having um, people contact us that want to be part of a business community supporting an equity and education lawsuit. We have uh, attorneys reaching out to us, talking about the work that we would need to do. It's not something that is going to happen overnight, but certainly we have had a very good start on that. So it's advocacy, it's getting our figures, and it's looking to be able to continue to move the work of the district forward. I'm sorry, yes, Mayor. Yep. Sure. So just to add on to the superintendent's con uh, comments, the, it, it is very early. We don't have numbers yet. Um, but you don't have to have numbers yet to know that it's going to be another budget crisis this year. Um, so uh, I think that, as the superintendent mentioned, we are trying to strategize both short term and long term how we tried to get the state to meet their constitutional obligation to the students in the city that they're not meeting right now. Um, in addition to some of the steps the superintendent mentioned, we are also meeting with our legislative delegation on Friday to give them a full briefing and talk about uh, what strategies they might be able to employ for us up on Beacon Hill during the current budget process because the House will be working on their budget this month and the Senate will be working on their budget next month. And uh, so we're going to try as hard as we can up there. The equity and education lawsuit is definitely moving forward and as the superintendent is uh, talking with superintendents uh, around the state, I'm also talking with mayors and part of the reason for my making the trip up to Worcester Thursday night is to have an opportunity to sit down with the Worcester mayor prior to the uh, school committee meeting. Uh, I was in New Bedford last week and met with the New Bedford mayor and uh, chapter 70 foundation formula and the inequities for gateway cities was right at the top of our uh, list of agenda items. So um, the reality is that, you know, the city will meet its obligation to the foundation budget and we're going to do the best we can to more than meet our obligation to the foundation budget. I don't know what those numbers will be yet. It's, it's too soon to tell. No matter what we're able to do, it will be a fraction of what we're not getting from the state. We just don't have the resources on the local level to replace, um, you know, ten, fifteen million dollars of underfunding by the state. Uh, so we're trying to come at this from every angle we possibly can. Um, the superintendent and I don't always a hundred percent agree. But we always work as hard as we can, both of us, to try to do the best we can for our kids. And, um, and then that's what we're doing. And I know that's what the school committee is going to do. And uh, we're just going to fight our way through another tough budget and do the best that we possibly can. Thank you, Mayor. And um, on that note, we're also going to be on Thursday uh, at the State House. I think we scout out our event where we're going to be inviting parents but we do have the Leading the Nation. We're very proud to take part in that. We will be sending a delegation. Uh, the Kennedy School principal, uh, Rogan, is going, along with a number of members, including uh, Jamie McDuffie Melnimo, who will be actually speaking at the event of the equity and education lawsuit so many years ago that meant so much to the city that positioned you 
as uh, uh, an urban district that was highly successful. And when you listen to Shama tonight talk about the Harvards, the Dartmouths, you know, the West Points, that is all of those years of really hard work by your teachers and your staff, making sure that every student is included and has an opportunity, whether you come from Weston or you come from Brockton, to be able to uh, have that education that the state is required under the law to provide to our students. So again, and, and I agree with the mayor, there's a lot of hard work ahead of us, and the one thing, mayor, you know, that we did talk about earlier was coming together, not dividing, and, you know, again, um, certainly advocating for what we need for our students and for our community to make sure we're doing the very best that we can. So uh, on that note, um, the strategic plan, um, Mr. D'Agostino, I'm going to wait for another evening on that. Um, it is still in the developing processes, so I would uh, like to wait and uh, extend that to uh, another school committee meeting. I do want to mention to everybody that we are rescheduling our middle uh, school parent-teacher conferences. We were snowed out. I forget the date in March where we were snowed out, but they are going to be on April 12th. It is a Thursday. Uh, there will be uh, afternoon and evening conferences. If there is a conflict in the conferences, you can work individually with your schools at a time for you to have conversation uh, with your teachers. Um, I also want to uh, thank uh, everybody for the uh, great, great um, group of parents, teachers that came together on the 27th of March for our Safety and Security Forum. I think we had well over 300 community members. Uh, I see Lieutenant Mills uh, in the audience. I want to thank him for a wonderful presentation. The feedback from parents was, although this is one of those subjects that is really hard to discuss, the safety of our staff, of our students, you know, looking to come into an educational institution. But you were um, very transparent with them. We answered all their questions. Uh, it was very informative. And they know that we continue to educate ourselves as to best practices, and we'll continue to share that with our, uh, our staff, our faculty, and our students so that we can continually be observant, remain safe, and understand what the protocols are. I want to thank officers Mosley and Anderson, who again were fabulous, very engaging with the parents on that issue of social media, which continues to, to haunt us uh, coming into the schools. Uh, it can be a wonderful thing for kids, and it can be something that we have to learn what those boundaries are. So um, mayor, uh, chief of police, um, fire chief, I want to thank everybody again for coming together and, and really supporting our community. Um, and I want to remind everybody also that Senator Ed Markey, I believe this Sunday, is going to be here April 8th. He is going to be, I think it's at the War Memorial yeah, Auditorium? War, yeah, War Memorial. From 3.30 to 5 p.m. And the reason I say that, when you heard me speak earlier at the finance meeting about Title I, about Title IIA, about Title III, about Title IV, when we talk about E-rate, these are things that we have to make sure that we have that voice in Washington that is talking again about what our school, and I think we dodged a bullet right now with Title I. I'll certainly know this summer, but that probably wasn't a very good pun to use, was no, it? I no. apologize, no, but <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm very sorry. But um, again, we need to make sure that we're advocating you know, for uh, all those funds. And uh, I'm just going to finish with uh, referring to subcommittee. We do have, uh, we need a policy subcommittee to talk about our social media policy, to talk about uh, military and foster family policies under Title I that we're required to do before June 1st, and also our handbook review for the 2018-19 uh, school year. So we would like to do the full school committee, and we will have one to outreach uh, to you to set up that meeting. And I believe that's it. Okay. So we'll... Tom and Wanda will take care of scheduling the policy meeting. Okay, how about report of the bid review subcommittee? Who's handling that one? Is that you, Tim? Go right ahead. The date is April 3rd, 2018, to the Brockton School Committee. From Aldo Petronio, Chief Budget Officer, Michael Bandis, Budget and Requisition Manager, Tim Sullivan, Chair. The minutes of the bid subcommittee Bid review subcommittee meeting on Tuesday, April 3rd, 2018. The bid review subcommittee of the Brockton School Committee convened on Tuesday, April 3rd, 2018 at 5.55 p.m. in the Rom Little Theater, Brockton High School, at 470 Forest Ave. 
present was Tim Sullivan Chair, Ms. Azak, Ms. Mr. D'Agostino, Mr. Petronio. Absent was Mr. Bandis. Tim Sullivan called the meeting to order at 6 p.m. after discussion of the fiscal year 2019 school mail delivery for three years. A motion was made by Tim Sullivan to accept a bid, which I might add was a low bid as presented. The motion was seconded by Joyce Azak. The vote was two affirmative and one abstained. The meeting was adjourned and seconded by Joyce Azak and the vote was unanimous. The meeting was adjourned at 6.04. The superintendent recommends the following motions. The motion is number one, to accept the report of the subcommittee as presented. Okay, so we've got a motion. How about a second? Second. second. So this motion is to accept the report. All in favor? Opposed? The report is accepted. The second motion is to recommend to the Brockton School Committee to award the school bid as presented. Okay, so the second motion is to award the bid. Do we have a second on that one? Second. Ms. Asak, okay, all in favor? Opposed? Unanimous, in favor. Okay. Thank you. All right. Do you want me to just take this one? Inclement weather? Yes, please, Mayor. Okay. So, uh, we have an agenda item to discuss uh, inclement weather, sidewalks, decisions to open or not open schools or delay the openings of schools. And uh, so I was asked to just kind of share with you some insight as to how uh, we go about <coughs> clearing sidewalks, which sidewalks get cleared, um, and how it's done. So I'll give you a little bit of background and perspective first. I guess I'm now in my ninth year on the school committee, going back to the beginning of my school committee service. And in my two terms on the school committee, at that period of time, and Tom was with me and Tim was there for part of it, um, you know, we had a lot of frustration trying to deal with the DPW in terms of particularly trying to get them to clear the sidewalks. Under a prior commissioner, the sidewalks were not a high priority. They usually wouldn't even begin to do them until the day after the storm. Uh, they would only use the same plow drivers that drove the, the plows, so they'd have to get the streets all done, let those drivers go home and get rest, and then come back the next day and start working on the sidewalks. It never worked very well. Small pieces of equipment, um, if the snow got too deep, by the time it was freezing and a day later, it never came out very good. Um, so at the time that I moved over here and became mayor, because of my uh, history here, uh, the sidewalks were a high priority that we needed to, to take a whole new approach to sidewalks. So during my first year uh, as mayor, I appointed a new DPW commissioner. And that kind of gave us a whole fresh start with, with Larry Rowley. At the time, so this is Larry and I, our fourth winter together now. Um, when we started together four years ago, or a little over four years ago, the city was plowing about between 40 and 45 miles of sidewalks, between 40 and 45 miles of sidewalks. Today, we plow 68 miles of sidewalks. We are plowing 50% more sidewalks with not only the same number of pieces of equipment, but except for one piece, the same equipment uh, that we were using five years ago. Um, the sidewalks that are plowed are basically wa school walking routes in the vicinity of our schools concentrating on the main roads. So it's impossible. Most of the side streets don't have sidewalks anyhow, but for the ones that do, we cannot possibly do every street in the city. We're already, I think, pushing as hard as we can with what we've got for resources. But we have expanded to a network of 68 miles of sidewalks. They are all on walking routes to schools. They're focused on primary streets. 
um, the eight pieces of equipment we have, seven of them we've had for some time and they're small pieces of equipment. We did purchase one larger new piece of equipment this year to try out and we like it a lot. The problem is it costs $160,000 for one. So we're not going to be going out to buy a whole fleet of them overnight, but we're going to try to come up with a plan to maybe at least acquire one each year in the budget. Um, we take a whole different approach now. So one of the obstacles we used to hear was the sidewalks couldn't be done any other way because of the various collective bargaining agreement union contracts. Well, we solved that in our first year. We impact bargain with several different bargaining units and for what we were told for years couldn't be done, we got done in our first year by simply sitting down and talking to all the unions and working with them. And so we now were able to work out with the unions a method in which we can go through various bargaining units in a certain order, offering the overtime to drive the sidewalk plows. And by being able to do this successfully, we now roll out the sidewalk plows at the same time we roll out the street plows. So when we begin plowing the streets, we begin plowing the sidewalks. And, you know, ballpark idea, that's usually around three inches of snow, depending on the forecast. Anywhere two, three, somewhere in there, we roll out the plows. It's made a huge difference because even though some of the equipment is smaller and older, if it's only going to push four inches of snow instead of a foot of snow, it does a much better job. In any typical snowstorm, depending how much we get, the sidewalks typically get plowed at least twice and often three times, depending on how much snow we get to get them to a condition we're satisfied with. Um, bus stops are always a question that's asked. Uh, there are over 500 school bus stops. There's no way in a million years that we ever have the personnel or the resources to go out and try to clear bus, uh, the bus stops. Having said that, we do do some of them on main roads and we do, Mr. Thomas and Mr. Thompson have an open line of communication with our DPW commissioner and when they get a call or they see something, if they have a particular concern, they call DPW, we get a piece of equipment out there as quick as we can um, to, to try to make it safer. Uh, there are challenges to doing sidewalks that I think a lot of people don't realize. It's hard, dangerous work running those sidewalk plows. The guys take a beating in them. They can only do so many hours because they're being bounced and jostled all around inside the cage. Uh, there are obstacles. It's hard to see where the sidewalk is. There are wires and posts and mailboxes and hydrants and yeah. And between the plows and the sidewalk plows, we did hit a few street signals, the uh, traffic lights and hydrants, um, comes with the territory. Uh, but I think there has been a dramatic improvement in, in how we do the sidewalks. Uh, there was one storm this past winter that we weren't satisfied with how they came out. It was a really tough storm to do. Um, that particular storm had high winds, blowing snows, when you've got almost zero visibility, it's a lot harder to do. We had to shut them down a couple times because it was too dangerous to even have them attempt to do it, which then allowed the snow to pile up faster than we would have liked. Um, and uh, the wind continued to blow for a couple more days and just kept blowing the snow back in. No matter how we do it, by doing it earlier, it works better. We try to get the sidewalk cleared early enough because we have this constant push and pull amongst the folks who live on the routes that where we're doing the sidewalks who are clearing their driveway and then if the plow comes back and pushes snow back in the driveway they're not very happy. So we've either got folks yelling at us that the sidewalks aren't good enough or we've got folks yelling at us that we're pushing snow back in their driveway. So it's, it, it's no matter what we do there's going to be some folks unhappy. Um, it's why we've gone to starting to use some blowers now. Now the blowers are not necessarily good the first time through on their own, but what we found is if you put a tandem with a V-plow in front and the blower coming behind it, it does a real good job. If the V-plow pushes through and then you can come behind it with the blower, it does a beautiful job. 
If we go back and clean up with the blower later, they can direct the blow of the snow and not just push it back into folks' driveways and parking lots. So in a perfect world, once the sidewalks are broken through for the first time, we try to incorporate the blowers um, to clean them up and make them better. Uh, I'm out checking them all the time, early in the morning, late at night. Uh, it gets frustrating also when we have the sidewalk guys out working all night long to get the sidewalks ready for school in the morning. And I get down the road at 7 o'clock in the morning and half the kids are walking in the street anyhow, even though the sidewalk is cleared really well. So some of it we just can't control. Um, so I think that's what else. I mean, I'll field questions. I'm trying to give you off the top of my head what I can think of. Lisa, go ahead. Thank you very much. Um, one issue that um, I noticed this past storm, and it was probably the exact one that you spoke of, was we had open school, but the sidewalks at the actual school, we're not talking a mile out, the sidewalk at the actual school had not been cleared. And I'm not sure if it was just somehow missed. Um, do we, so my question was, do we have a policy where we're physically checking before we open school? Is somebody, are the groundskeepers there to say all clear? because that was, that was an issue. So depending where it is, if it's actually on school property, that's school personnel yes. that clears that sidewalk. So that's not the city, that's school personnel. And I got a feeling that's probably just, Mr. Thomas, I'll deflect that one to you. The school property is school personnel that clears those. Um, we, during snowstorms, typically have several emergency meetings in our emergency operations center. The school department, Usually the superintendent and the uh, deputy superintendent are typically both there or at least a couple representatives from the schools along with all the other city departments. Um, on any given day, uh, it's the superintendent's final call as to what we do with school. Um, but I think that the superintendent has the benefit of a lot of input from a lot of city departments before she has to make that call. And sometimes when we let the call go in the morning, Mr. Thomas and I are on the phone at 4, 4.15 in the morning after we've had a chance to go out that morning and see what things look like. Um, they're not always easy calls. We're trying to keep the schools open as best we can, but we're never going to jeopardize student safety to get a day in of school. Um, the, um, I don't know, Superintendent, do you want to add to I know that the part? The one thing I would like, Mayor, is um, really this is all I've known, and I feel with all of the things that we deal with, it is an excellent operation. And I want to thank Commissioner Rowley because I, I don't think there's anybody more collaborative, uh, more approachable. Um, if there is a problem, you know, we, we'll work together to fix it. So well, your concern. Yes. But, yeah. but that is something that, you know, we'll work with Deputy Superintendent Thomas, our own staff, I agree, you know, to make sure the kids can certainly get into the schools that we've spent hours preparing. Yeah. But I do agree, Mayor, it's, um, it's a system with the Brockton Emergency Management, people coming together, and when you're making decisions, you know, we're, we're making it together. It isn't, as one of my neighbors once said, standing in the window looking yeah. out and uh, making a decision. But and when you think that we are getting out with everything that happened certainly never mind the month of March, we were doing pretty well. We had two days. And remember, we had an October storm also, which we did a delay. We had some wires down. We were kind of back and forth as we saw the condition of the city. And we were able to get that day in. Thank goodness it was safe for the kids to come and get their day in of school in the fall. We lost um, another two days, I think, before February vacation. I thought we were going to be on easy street. And we know what has happened this past month and continues to happen. And we are still getting out June 26th with a half a day. So that was our built-in five uh, snow days. Um, this is, we ended up with a sixth day because we do not compromise the safety of children. We do understand parents. We understand working. Um, and, and we need to have kids come to school on a regular basis. But it's been a challenge. But these four years, I want to thank the team because I do feel supported in making decisions in the best interest of our community. And we do, so a couple of things I can tell you after five winters. Um, every storm is different. No two storms are alike. Uh, so they all, every time it's a new experience trying to figure out what to do. Um, we 
never put the street plows and the students out on the street at the same time. So that's always one of the factors that comes in. We're talking with the DPW and asking them when do they think they'll be wrapping up street operations so that we know whether they're going to be off the streets before we would put the students on. In a couple of those delayed openings, that was one of the primary factors in delaying the openings was at 6 o'clock they couldn't guarantee us they'd be all off the street, but at 8 they could. They knew with a couple more hours they could wrap up. It also impacts getting off the streets, and I probably should have been a little clearer on the school property. We do plow the parking lots in the school, so the city does plow the school parking lots, but the school personnel clear the, the, the walks um, and sidewalks and walkways around the schools. So in most cases, we've got to get the streets done first for public safety, then get in and do the school parking lots, with the exception of the high school where we keep a couple pieces of big equipment there all the time that go to work immediately on the high school. Um, so there's a, there's a lot of moving parts to it, and I think this year, I think we did really well compared to most other school districts. I mean, you get these other school districts that are talking about, you know, having to days. yeah add hours and can't get another day in before the end of July. And you know, I think we were actually able to use a couple of delayed openings that avoided us closing the schools, and and uh, you know, we do the best we can. That's okay. All you, all you want. Thank you. So, um, for the street lights for um, the children hitting the walk buttons. Now, I don't you even know how many. So, pedestrian signals? Exactly. So, if you oh. have a child, they're walking to the bus stop. Um, this past storm, I had received a few calls that the children actually couldn't even get, hit the buttons. They couldn't get over the mounds of snow to be able to, you know, in certain streets to be able to cross safely to get to their stops. Mm. How so these are intersections that don't have crossing guards? Correct. I don't have an immediate answer for that one because we've also got our guys keep hitting the traffic signals, so um, I don't know. I have to look at that. I don't have an easy answer for that one. Okay. Great. Well, thank you very much. Yeah. Judy. Mm -hmm. I've lived in the city a long time. It's definitely a way better operation for the sidewalks. Um, I just had um, a mother that has a student down by the Lamberts um, fruit and deli, and during the blizzard, you know, the really bad blizzard, um, she, and I even went down all of Crescent, she, the child walks to the bluff from down near Lamberts, and it's just a sixth grader. So um, they, and they weren't cleared all the way from Lamberts down to Bluff. So that's that's a case where if you let you know Mike or Ken know, they call us. We get someone out there. Again, it's you know, it's 68 miles of sidewalk. So when I was sitting in your seat, we didn't even go that far. Right. We didn't even attempt to plow that far. Right. Um, that because that was a complaint I used to get all the time. Right. Um, but one of the challenges with the sidewalk plows is they break down a lot. So we start off with eight pieces at the beginning of the storm. It's not unusual to be down to six by the end of the storm. And we're literally working on them and getting a piece of equipment back out and then another one. Other than the new one we bought this year, they're, they're kind of small pieces of equipment. And I, we've probably had them for, I don't know, eight mm -hmm. years, ten years now. They're not, it's not new equipment and, and they take a beating doing the job. So part of this is, you know, one of these sidewalk plows will break down. They've got to get it back in the shop. They're trying to get it repaired to get it back out again. They get that one out. Another one breaks down. So I think that's where sometimes a section might not get done when it should because a piece of equipment broke down. But again, if, if, um, if the school department calls the DPW and says what they've got, the DPW will respond. They'll get a piece of equipment there as soon as yeah, they Yeah, no, they did. They did yeah. respond and they did clear it out. Yeah. But school was already opened. Yeah. You know, it, it was after school opened. So just, I worry about, you know, the kids walking in the street. It's just a sixth grader. And we have parents calling us, so we have to be accountable yeah, I, to them. No one worries about them more than I do. I don't get a whole lot of sleep during those storms. Thank you. Anyone else? Come on, you got your shot. 
I told Larry I could handle it, so I got to make sure I can handle it. Well, please invite Larry to come. Right. I know how busy he is, but we would like to thank him for yeah. all. You can the also hard call me DPW. when you have one of those situations too. Yeah. I mean, I would prefer you call Mr. Thomas or Mr. Thompson, but you can feel free to call me too if there's a situation that needs to be addressed. I'm, I'm out and driving around the city, and we'll, you can call me too. You guys all have my number. Thank you. And Thank you. A, a couple of things. I, I want to mention the uh, Spring Choral Concert last Wednesday, e Wednesday evening. This is such a wonderful time of year to highlight all of our students. I know we had the middle school uh, also concerts, um, chorus concerts. They were just wonderful. And Mayor, I know you join me in We Are Streaming Live. So tomorrow evening, and I know Sharma mentioned this, uh, April 4th, uh, right here at the Nelson Auditorium starting at 7 is the Brockton High School Concert Band, a Woodwind Ensemble, Advanced Concert Band, and special guest artist, Emmy Award-winning composer, Randy Klein's world premiere of Brockton. This is an original composition that will be played, uh, by, performed by our students. Um, and it's a three-movement work titled Brockton and will encompass the pulse of the city's past, present, and future. So tickets are $4. It is a wonderful take. Um, and I would hope people come out to, I am really looking forward to, to hearing that piece. And, uh, and I just want to give one more shout out to one of our seniors, and I don't mean seniors in high school, one of our senior <coughs> citizens, uh, Mrs. Margaret Gorman, who's from Ward 1 and told me she watches every one of our school committee meetings <coughs> and is very interested in the work that we're doing and compliments us on the hard work of supporting our youngsters. So Mrs. Gorman, this is for you. Anyone else under new business have something they'd like to mention? No? Tom, you sure? All right, all right. So then we'll entertain a motion to adjourn then. Second? Favor? Meeting adjourned. Thank you very much.